2020 was one of the most chaotic and turbulent years in recent history. Between a global pandemic, lockdowns, riots, and the presidential election, many of the finer details faded into the background. Among the tumult, one thing that managed to stand out was a certain group which, over the past few years, has received the ire of many a Fox News host. You saw the title of the video, you already know what I'm talking about, Antifa, short for Anti-Fascist Action. Antifa draws its roots from similar groups in Weimar, Germany, as a movement dedicated to preventing the rise of fascism. The American iteration of Antifa has been around in one form or another for some time, first appearing in the 1970s and 80s. But they only rose to prominence with the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Antifa were among the various anti-Trump protests that took place in the aftermath of his election, and were at the forefront of the disrupted J20 protests that took place on Inauguration Day in 2017. With this, Antifa caught the eye of the mainstream media, and gained extensive coverage, catapulting them to sudden national recognition. Their protests became more common, and continued to receive media attention. More specifically, they earned the hatred of conservative outlets and commentators who painted them as a violent mob trampling on the rights of American citizens to political assembly and expression. It's at this point that we need to talk about what Antifa actually is. Something that's first and foremost important for me to explain is that Antifa is not a single organization that you can join or leave, that has any kind of leadership or structure. While it is true that there do exist loose organizations which operate under the Antifa banner, there is still no centralized organizational structure. It is a movement composed of smaller groups, or as FBI Director Christopher Wray put it, it is an ideology. This may seem like a trivial distinction at face value, but it's going to be rather important later on, so keep it in mind. Antifa's goal is quite simple, and they don't bother hiding it. They want to prevent the rise of fascism, which to them means going out and directly, physically fighting far-right activists. They argue that this deters the far-right from holding their rallies and spreading their message. Many conservatives, and frankly most liberals as well, took issue with their methods, as they believe that infringed on the free speech rights of those activists. Now, I'm not interested in partaking in that debate, and that isn't what this video is about, because unfortunately, we have moved far, far past that stage. In the four years since it was brought to national attention, Antifa has evolved from a fringe group of controversial radicals into a scapegoat for conservatives for all manner of travesties. It's not at all uncommon nowadays to hear that Antifa is a well-funded communist organization and plot to overthrow the United States of America. We unmask undercover footage of their national organizer, the national organizer for refused fascism, and we release footage that suggests who might even be funding their militant operation. Mozilla funding Antifa anarcho-commies rise up. CNN is raising money for Antifa. Keep in mind that the viewers who took that advice, who followed CNN's guidance and sent money to Antifa, helped fund Saturday's terror attack. How did we get here? How did the perception and characterization of Antifa change so much and so radically in the last four years? The answer is far from simple, and that involves a cycle of media radicalization which I'd like to explore. This cycle includes three main steps. Propaganda, which fosters fear, which, left unchecked, grows into paranoia. Propaganda is a word often associated with authoritarian regimes indoctrinating their own citizens into supporting them or their cause. But in truth, propaganda has a much broader meaning than this. Propaganda is defined by Merriam-Webster as the spreading of ideas, information, or rumor for the purpose of helping or injuring an institution, a cause, or a person. All political marketing and messaging is, in essence, a form of propaganda, and despite the negative connotation, there is nothing inherently bad about it. The lessons we teach our children against racial discrimination are a form of propaganda. The Declaration of Independence is, at its core, a glorified piece of propaganda. However, there's a good reason why the word has the reputation that it does, and that's because of propaganda's ability to twist reality. 
It's become almost blasé to state that America is in a politically hyperpolarized state like we've never seen before. This is far too often simply taken for granted and glossed over, but it's well worth examining the causes of this polarization. Without delving into more complex psychological processes of tribalism, modern American political polarization can in very large part be laid at the feet of the national media. Starting sometime in the 90s and accelerating into the current day, the American media has grown consistently more and more sensationalistic as the news has become less so reporting on current events and more so entertainment for the masses. And what's more entertaining than a good old-fashioned us-versus-them narrative, wherein one side, or our side, is the virtuous good who can do no wrong, and the other side is a corrupting evil destroying the nation. In the last 30 years, slight political biases on channels like Fox and NBC have evolved into full-on partisan hackery, with most major news channels staunchly taking one side or the other, left or right, liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican. With both this newfound media environment and the advent of social media in the 2000s, people began locking themselves into political echo chambers of others they agreed with. It's been a common stereotype in TV shows for a couple of decades now to poke fun at the deranged way that Republicans and Democrats see one another, but it's no longer a joke. Republicans and Democrats don't just have distorted views of one another anymore, they practically live in their own separate worlds. Truth is rapidly becoming inseparable from opinion. And this is where we circle back to Antifa. Since 2016, Fox News and online right-wing commentators have villainized Antifa to a greater and greater extent. At first, they were described as a riotous mob and little more. They evolved eventually into being described as something more akin to a paramilitary group. This gradual vilification, which had subtly started accelerating after the Charlottesville rally, went into overdrive with the beginning of the George Floyd riots. Donald Trump proclaimed them to be a domestic terrorist organization, even though, as I explained earlier, they aren't an organization of any kind. Conservative media followed suit, spreading absolutely baseless conspiracy theories about their supposedly massive role in the riots. By the time of the 2020 election, Antifa was a perfect scapegoat. Any fear-mongering term applied to them by a talk show host who needed a convenient punching bag was accepted without question by Republican audiences. Antifa is a communist plot to overthrow the United States, funded by George Soros, in league with the Democrats, intent on destroying the Republic. This is all, of course, complete nonsense. In truth, Antifa is little more than a disorganized band of teenagers and young adults, primarily of a wealthier extraction, who go out burning and smashing up property in the name of their pathetic, LARPing communist revolution, which will never come to pass because their ideals are even more of a bad joke than they are. Antifa is not a threat. They are not worth any of the attention that they have and their menace is an illusion created and upheld almost entirely by sensational media. Yet now, as a result of this sensationalism, tens if not hundreds of millions of Americans buy into the notion of Antifa as some elaborate communist conspiracy. And out of this notion is born fear. We as humans like to think that, with all our technology and culture and advancement, we've risen above the cavemen from whom we descend. But the reality is that on a fundamental, psychological level, we haven't changed in the slightest. There are varying claims as to how many basic emotions humans have, but regardless of how many there are, all estimates include fear as a primordial impulse of the human race. When fear takes over, logic and rationality cease to function, as the primal fight-or-flight instinct takes over. Therefore, when fear guides politics, the same applies, as reasoning is cast aside in favor of emotion. It is this primeval instinct which sensationalistic media in the style of Fox News preys upon in their so-called reporting. When they villainize Antifa in the manner I described before, not only do they create a scapegoat, exaggerating and twisting reality to fit their political agenda, but so too do they make their viewers, listeners, and readers 
fear the perceived threat of Antifa. And when they start linking Antifa to the Democrats and the broader American left, that fear extends to not just Antifa, but to anything opposed to the political right. With their viewers mostly locked in a conservative Republican echo chamber, they're able to freely dispense borderline conspiracy theories to their audience with no questions asked. Fear, left untempered for long enough by reason, inevitably devolves into paranoia. Paranoia is fear in its most extreme and unhinged form. Where fear exists as an evolutionary response to danger, paranoia is rather more similar to a mental illness, and in fact, in very extreme cases, can be a symptom of one. It is characterized by delusions of persecution and grandeur. In the case of Antifa, and the broader vilification of anything even remotely left-wing, rampant lies and fear-mongering have fostered on the right a culture of baseless conspiracy theories, hatred of their supposed opponents, and a cult-like loyalty to the former president. When reason, civility, and common sense are abandoned, any number of deranged conspiracies can be taken as fact without question. And this isn't just limited to Antifa. Rather, it's descriptive of a broader trend in American politics, and specifically, on the right. It is this political state which has gotten us to the perpetual boiling point that we're at now, where it is always about us versus them. Where, because it is taken as a default that our side must always be correct, any misdeed, any bad policy, any inflammatory comment, anything whatsoever that would cast a negative light on our side, can be brushed off and instead blamed on the other side. This was best demonstrated when, in response to the Capitol riots, many of the more conspiratorial Trump supporters spread the completely unfounded lie that all or most of the people who stormed the Capitol were members of Antifa. There was never any evidence for this. The people who were propagating this notion were not concerned with coming to a conclusion based on evidence. Instead, they invented evidence out of thin air to back up their preconceived notions about Antifa, inculcated into them by Fox News, One America News Network, various online right-wing commentators, and what have you. Much the same, in terms of living in a political echo chamber and vilifying all who might oppose them, can be said about many Democrats, and I fully expect to receive comments on this video whining about how the left also does this. Yes, I know the left also does this, but that isn't the focus of this video. I may well do a video on the left-wing echo chamber at some point, but I categorically refuse to accede to the notion that I, or anyone else, must equivocate with every political statement we make that disparages one or the other side. This endless demand for equivocation, playing down what your side does wrong and playing up what their side does wrong, is indicative of so many of the issues we're facing. When you define yourself not by what you support, but only by what you oppose, it is easy to drive yourself to lunatic beliefs in an incredibly short space of time, and creates the endless race to the bottom known as America's ever-wondrous two-party system. I heartily join the Democrats in laughing at Trump supporters who say that Trump is still their president. But those same Democrats will conveniently try to make you forget that four years ago, not my president was a liberal slogan against then-President Trump. This cultivation of paranoia through sensational media creates the negative feedback loop known as American political polarization. This process can only lead to one thing. Destruction. The human mind is more powerful than we tend to give it credit for. Just as it can solve incredibly complex problems, innovate, and advance our society, so too is it easy for people to delude themselves into ideas that are not just absurd, but dangerous in their extremity. The rise of sensational media, which profits off of anger and vitriol, the subsequent political echo chambers, the abandonment of civility, and the polarization that has resulted, is tearing this country apart. Agitators like Tim Pool, who've been screeching their lungs off for the past four years about how we're headed for civil war, are not only brain-dead, but wrong. America is not headed for a civil war. We are rather headed to a total collapse of the Republican system and the rise of a strongman who was able to exploit these primal emotions. 
When you get down to it, Donald Trump is little more than a cacophonous baboon who he somehow managed to put in the White House. Even with his complete lack of any kind of political understanding, he understood how to appeal to emotion, and his actions brought us closer than ever to the brink of collapse. He serves as a cryptic warning for what is to come if we don't swiftly and aggressively correct course. I get asked, whenever I say these kinds of things, what I specifically refer to. There are many reforms this country needs, and I have several videos planned describing some of them, but on a broader societal level, we have to break out of our political bubbles and talk to each other again as citizens and as equals, and to be able to distinguish sensational fiction from actual reality. Hatred stems from ignorance, and therefore the antidote to hatred is understanding. Fear stems from the unknown, and therefore, the antidote to fear is knowledge. You cannot get rid of these feelings simply by taking thought, but you can at least recognize that you have them and prevent them from contaminating your mental processes. The emotional urges which are inescapable, and are perhaps even necessary to political action, should be able to exist side by side with an acceptance of reality. Thanks for watching. This video suffered delay after delay, and I'm releasing this two weeks later than I originally intended to. Nonetheless, it is finally finished, and it's the longest video I've made since 2019. So if you got this far, I would greatly appreciate it if you left a comment, liked the video, and subscribed for future content. The next video's topic is no secret, but I won't divulge it here. All I'll say is that it's intended to be released sometime in May, so the content drought you're about to experience from me is not me giving up the channel, it's just a very large project which I've been planning to do for months. And again, making this video showed me that my deadlines are worth deadly squat, and I will keep you people updated in the event of any delays. Join the Discord server and follow my Twitter if you want to talk to me or get updates on the next video. I'll be hosting a stream sometime within the next couple weeks, the specific date and time of which I'll clarify in a community post as soon as I figure it out, to discuss this video, answer questions, and the like. Consider it a director's commentary of sorts. Anyway, with that all said, thanks again, and goodbye.